Hello and welcome to the Grant Street Experience. I'm your host, Grant Irvin, Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Pittsburgh. I have my fabulous co-host with me, Rebecca Kiernan. Rebecca, how are you today? Hey, good morning. Good to see you. So we have a, a, a couple of special guests with us uh, today. Uh, we have uh, Subhu Ramachadran and Albert Presto from Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, welcome, Albert. Welcome, Subhu. How are you guys? Hi. Hey, good to be here. Good to see you all. Um, Rebecca, maybe I'm going to turn to you first and maybe uh, we have a special topic today, which is air quality, uh, which is one that is kind of near and dear to your, your heart. Um, and so you're, you're able to, to uh, locate and corral Albert and Subu for us to bring them to the podcast. So maybe you want to kind of intro the, the topic a little bit uh, from your perspective. Sure. I mean, I'm not the expert on it, but um, we've been doing a lot of work to uh, try to improve the situation uh, or improve the air quality from, you know, whatever we can do from city operations. So, um, you know, reducing our uh, diesel emissions from our vehicles, um, trying to reduce the amount of energy that we use so that um, we're using less energy that's coming from dirty sources. Um, so I'm really interested to hear, um, you know, from an expert's perspective, uh, exactly, you know, what the issues are and, and how the monitoring is going and, and how to tackle some of that. Awesome. And so you found two, two of the best experts, I think, not just in the, in the city, but uh, probably nationally, maybe worldwide with regards to air quality uh, and the impacts of air quality. So uh, glad to have you guys here with us today. Uh, maybe we'll start with you, Albert. Uh, we'll just do some brief introductions about who you are, uh, kind of the role that you have, and uh, and and then we'll go to Subu and, and have the same. Sure. And uh, yeah, thanks for the chance to talk to you guys today. Uh, so I'm a professor of mechanical engineering at Carnegie Mellon, um, and I've been doing air quality related stuff since, uh, well, since 2001, actually, like my second week of grad school was 9-11. So uh, um, and so, you know, I do a lot of work, a lot of my work focuses on understanding sort of urban air quality and how neighborhoods differ from each other. Um, and then we try and link that to like people's health and to sort of environmental and social justice. Uh, so we've done a lot of work in that regard. And because it's sort of easy to do a lot of this in your backyard, we've done a lot of it in Pittsburgh and we try and do it in a way that we can understand like the whole country. Uh, but we specifically learn a lot about Pittsburgh itself. Um, since you were letting me introduce myself, I'm going to plug, I have my own podcast. It's called Shared Air. So if you want to hear more about air quality <laughs> stuff, you should find it. Uh, and since there's a video version, my background here um, is an image that I grabbed off Twitter from a Pittsburgh photographer named David DeCello. Um, and so I wanted to give him credit for the image uh, since I didn't take it. To totally awesome. We, we also do a lot of uh, name dropping and kind of uh, shared advertisement on here. So we're, we're, we're here by dubbing Shared Air as being our official sponsor for the Grant Street Experience for today's podcast. So, <laughs> <laughs> awesome. so it's mutual. Subaru, how about, how about you? A little bit on yourself and your background? Uh, yeah. So I also got into air quality basically the first week of my grad school, which was uh, in July of 2000. Uh, so actually, this was the first, probably the first time I'd left India. And uh, I arrived in Pittsburgh on the evening of July the 3rd, 2000. And the next day was July the 4th. And I thought every day would be like this. It would be <laughs> yeah. everywhere, but, uh, you know, uh, and then... Uh, but that's when I started working on air quality. Uh, I worked on air quality in Pittsburgh for my PhD, looking at source, sources of air, call, air pollution in Pittsburgh. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I've been working on air quality and atmospheric chemistry ever since. And uh, then I left CMU in 2004 after my PhD and uh, came back in 2013 and worked there again for the last six years, closely with Albert and Alan Robinson, who was on the uh, the uh, head of mechanical engineering department at CMU. And Alan was also my PhD advisor. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, so I think we've been doing some, a lot of great work at Carnegie Mellon and in Pittsburgh. 
And uh, I think Pittsburgh being sort of the home to a lot of air, air pollution and air quality issues, I think is a good place to study. Uh, maybe not such a great place to live in, but you know, in terms of air pollution, but it's still better than a lot of other places. But you know, that's for the rest of the podcast. Interesting. But good to be here. Yeah. So, so both of you, uh, it, it seems like your first week of grad school was very influential for both of you <laughs> in your careers. Um, what, uh, I guess, what kind of uh, sparked the interest uh, in terms of your, your course of study and now kind of your professional disciplines? We'll go to maybe Albert. Well, I answered the first one first. Why don't you let Subu go first? All right, we'll go to Subu. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Uh, the so in a single word, money. Money. <laughs> yeah. Well, no. I mean, so uh, you know, for speaking as an international student, you know, when you're trying to do a PhD in the United States and some of the best schools in the country, uh, you know, let's be honest, tuition and living expenses are you know not something that everybody can afford, right? Mm -hmm. And. Uh, uh, CMU was uh, one of the schools that gave me a full scholarship to come study air pollution for my PhD. And uh, that sort of, you know, took me uh, to Pittsburgh. Uh, but, you know, I haven't quit, you know, I'm still working in air pollution 21 years later. Uh, and I think uh, I've learned a lot of new things along the way, which always keeps me interested. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, you know, it's a good choice. It partly motivated my money, but also motivated by the intellectual challenges involved. Yeah. The curiosity component. Absolutely. Curiosity. Yeah. And and Albert yourself. Yeah, the, there is not a plan, let's put it that way. Uh, you know, it's sort of I kept pursuing things that I thought were interesting. Um, so sometimes I describe it as a random walk. So the way um I so I studied chemical engineering and the way that uh we had to pick an advisor in grad school was basically to listen to the whole faculty give like a pitch and then say, Oh, I like, you know, these are my top three. Um, and it turned out that my top ones were people doing sort of atmospheric chemistry and air quality stuff. And that's how I got into it. And then kept finding interesting stuff that I wanted to do in that sort of space and continue to find interesting stuff. So until that runs out, I guess this is what I'm doing. You just keep going at it. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's interesting for me. I mean, uh, the whole idea of atmospheric chemistry, uh, you know, that that's something that when I first got into this work, I, I kind of kicked myself because I didn't understand the contextualization of it. Um, and that, you know, air, many people, as you know, kind of take it for granted, right? Um, but there's a lot of components that go into uh, the atmosphere and air and air quality and, and this idea that there is a certain chemistry or balance to it. Um, could you explain for us uh, some, you know, for, for the, the layman's terms a little bit, I guess, but some of the components that go into good air versus bad air um, and, and maybe how you can uh, categorize that a little bit. Okay, can, I think I'll, ta I'll tackle that first. I had to temper myself because the atmosphere itself is very cool. And if you want to think about like very fundamental reactions, the atmosphere is a really neat place to do that. I mean, in terms of sort of people interacting with the atmosphere, um, you know, I think it's some of air pollution, people sort of know it when they see it, right? If you're like next to a burning pile of trash, right? It smells, it looks gross. You know, it, it feels like something that's harming you. Um, and, you know, and so that's easy to tell. I think what's harder to tell is that, you know, you breathe your whole life, you know, for decades. And so even small amounts of air pollution over those chronic time scales can really add up and, and harm you. Um, and so there are specific pollutants that the EPA cares about. Um, sort of the big ones are, well, you know, it has a couple different names. It could be PM or particulate matter or fine particles. These are just particles. They could be solid or liquids that are floating around in the atmosphere. Um, and then the other one that We'll probably end up talking about some of its ozone, which is a more of a summertime thing. Mm -hmm. And it's not so bad anymore, but you used to be able to go and like you could go to LA in the summer and it could, you could smell the ozone. You can't quite get that anymore. Sometimes if you walk, sometimes um, hotel rooms will use ozone to clean 
between residents or between guests. And so if you go into a hotel room and it smells sort of like antiseptic, it might be because they just blasted it with ozone. Interesting, interesting. Um, Subu, for you, you guys have, uh, how did you guys start to collaborate together, um, you and Albert? What was kind of the, the genesis of the, the professional partnership that you guys have? Oh, God. Uh, it's been so long, I, I'm not sure I remember, but I think, well, we, we overlapped in grad school, right? And uh, so we kind of knew each other, though we didn't exactly work with each other at that time. And then when I came back in 2013, Albert was there, now a professor at Carnegie Mellon, and uh, we shared a lot of similar interests. I mean, we were both interested in air pollution. Uh, I think we, uh, I, we first started looking at methane emissions from the natural gas industry. Uh, that was the big project that I, that I was brought back to work on with Alan Robinson and then Al, Albert was also there and we ended up working on it together. Uh, I mean, I think to a large extent, actually, I think Albert, Alan, and I kind of have very similar research interests in terms of air pollution. And we are all measurement people, right? Experimentalists, Albert, you would say, I would say. Uh, or maybe I should call it field work. Yeah. But uh, we try to measure things. Uh, I mean, if you want to understand something, the best way to do that for us is to measure it and see what's going on. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, we were bouncing off ideas of each other and, uh, you know, we said, all right, we like this idea and we, it's always fun to be in a discussion with Alan and Albert, because it's like, you know, these guys always come with smart ideas and, you know, you throw up some ideas and you come up with some mix of different ideas and hopefully you come up with some good ideas that get funded, which is actually important as well. Mm -hmm. And so we end up working together. And I think there wasn't ever any sort of competition that, you know, oh, I shouldn't work with this guy, but more like let's work together. And mm -hmm. I think that's sort of a culture that uh, I think Carnegie Mellon and the Center for Atmospheric Particle Studies actually strongly encourages, in my opinion. Uh, I mean, so yeah, so that's, that's, that's how we started working together. Maybe Albert has a different take on it. <laughs> <laughs> no, What's I think that was a good... I think that was a good description. I think it really took off when we started with the low cost sensors, which was sort of, I don't know, 2013 in the summer, you know, we had both heard there were people interested in doing air pollution sensing with, with sort of cheap sensors. And we were both like, well, yeah, what the heck? Let's, you know, we had an undergrad there and said, hey, go. And, and he was sort of a tinkerer. And we said, all right, go have at it and like see if some of this even works at all. Interesting. Was that it River? Sort of, yeah, I'm thinking of River. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he was an undergrad student at uh, Penn State, right? McKeesport? Right, right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this our, is this our collaborator, Eric Lipsky, who is a faculty member at Penn State McKeesport. And, uh, but he was also a CMU grad. Eric and I shared a lab together during our PhD. And then he continues working with CMU. And so he brings the students over for internships. So I guess, uh, you know, any student out there in the Pittsburgh area who wants to do an internship at CMU, you should contact Albert now. <laughs> Rebecca, you had a question? Yeah, so my, my first introduction to Pittsburgh's air quality was through these spec monitors, um, which I think is what you were alluding to with those low cost monitors. Um, Cause I know that those came out of CMU. I was, in, I was actually in like the trial batch um, the first year that they came out. Um, so I guess I, I was just wondering if, you know, you could talk a little bit about like what are, what's the air quality monitoring technology that's out there that you guys use? Um, like, how are you doing the monitoring? And then I'd, I'd be interested in like, you know, what are the results and like, what's the 101 of, of like what's in Pittsburgh's air? Albert, do you want to go? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so we don't, the, the specs are in the in the sort of spectrum of low cost sensors. We don't work with them directly. They come out of a, the um, Create yeah. Lab at CMU. Um, we use some different stuff, but it's, this, it, you know, it's a similar idea. It's sort of to make, the whole idea is if you can measure cheaply, you can measure in a lot of places or you can really democratize things and let lots of people have sensors, right? Um, and that's in contrast to, uh, you know, sort of there is a there is a really big EPA mandated regulatory um, network for measuring air quality, um, but it's really expensive, right? Because 
the EPA has to be able to defend this stuff in court and make laws about it. And so they just have, you know, the equipment's expensive. It takes a lot of people. The, the, the data quality requirements are super high. Um, and so it produces awesome data, but I mean, there can only, I think in Allegheny County, it's run by the County Health Department. There are something like 10 sites and they have a full-time staff that is sort of maxed out just taking care of their 10 sites. Yeah. Um, you know, the low cost approach, I mean, clearly the data aren't gonna be quite as good because the stuff is cheaper and because we're sort of leaving it there and not checking on it every single day, uh, but we can put out a lot. And, you know, so we can get sort of more spatial coverage or we can do things like put them in people's homes and outside their homes. And, you know, you can get a rich picture that way. Um, and so, you know, we don't run the EPA network, that's the health department. You know, we run a network of low cost sensors around Pittsburgh that, you know, is, uh, I forget how many are in it right now. At its peak, it was 50, but we trimmed it down because some were redundant. Um, but we've been running it continuously since about 2016. We're Can I share my screen really quick? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, the sensors that we're talking about are these things, right? And so I don't know if you have seen them, there's about, I think there, as Albert said, at one point there are 50 such boxes in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, and now we are down to probably about 30 or 35, I think. So, you know, these are little boxes and they have gas sensors and PM sensors next to them for particulate matter and the gas sensors measure ozone, carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide. Mm -hmm. uh, the other low cost sensors that you might be familiar with are the PERP layer network. So this is basically mm -hmm. all the PERP layer nodes in Pittsburgh right now, it looks pretty clean, right? Green is clean, right? This, uh, is, a, Tubu, this so, is a current picture right now? Yeah, this is a live map. Okay. And uh, so, you know, obviously it's a huge, you know, lots of sensors all over the US and the world, but there's a lot of them in, in Pittsburgh. And I think one of the nice things about Pittsburgh is there's a very strong uh, commu local community who, who are interested in air pollution. Uh, so there's GASP, there's uh, Mark Dixon has put out a lot of these things through crowdfunding uh, sensors. So there's a lot of local interest. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, we've put up sensors similar to this, they are not on live map, but that's, uh, I think all the purple air sensors measure fine PM or PM 2.5. And, and tell us a little bit, RAMP is the, is it regional air quality monitoring project? Is that right? Uh, no, it's- <laughs> That was my guess. Yeah. <laughs> It became that way, uh, but let's see here if I can, oh, there we go. Uh, so if we came up with the name, real-time affordable multi-pollutant monitor. Okay, all right. Yeah. Uh, That's the difference of, between an academic acronym and a government acronym. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, ahead, I mean, there are a lot of people who make acronyms in academia and some are really skilled at it. I mean, well, depending on your level of skill, right? They're, they're the people who like take the middle, the, you know, the letter from the middle of the word and put in their acronym. This was literally like we were putting in a short proposal and we needed a name for the thing and had like an hour. <laughs> and so, <laughs> you know, it was a little bit like, okay, this works and it makes a word. So there we go. So go, go back a little bit. Like, so they're measuring carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, ozone and fine particulate. And we've talked a little bit about that. Uh, why measure these pollutants? Like what is the Im importance of these particular ones? So uh, these are the uh, criteria pollutants that are important these days. It's a, so the EPA monitors and regulates six criteria pollutants. So mm -hmm. these five and lead. And okay. lead is more of a you know, ground uh, pollutant uh, I mean, there is lead in the air, obviously, but a lot less so than when it was leaded gasoline. Now we also to unleaded gasoline. So a lot of the lead in the air has gone away. Uh, but these are the fi five airborne pollutants that are most important. Mm -hmm. uh, and really what is more important these days is PM 2.5, ozone, and NO2. SO2 is useful just because of the industry around Pittsburgh, the Mon Valley industry. Uh, that emits sulfur dioxide and hydrogen sulfide. We don't measure H2S, but we measure SO2. Uh, NO2 is often an indicator for traffic pollution, like vehicular traffic, vehicular exhaust. Uh, carbon monoxide can also be from traffic. 
and ozone is a regional secondary pollutant. And so a combination is basically it's criteria pollutants plus it gives you some indication of the sources of air pollution. Okay. So sulfur dioxide can be industry, NO2 and CO can be traffic, you know, things like that. Interesting. So, so then if you see like a high elevated level of one or the other, that can tell you whether it's a mobile point source or a, a, a fixed point source pollutant. Exactly. Hopefully, yeah. to some extent, right? Everything has to be qualified because uh, it's not an exact, it's, uh, you need a lot more data, but these give you some idea of what's going on. Interesting. I think so, Rebecca had a question. Yeah, we've, yeah. we've looked at this a lot from like the impacts on our residents and, and resident health um, and some of the disparities between, you know, which, which groups of people are, uh, you know, experiencing the, the worst of those impacts. So there's, you know, a few studies that have been done that are like a 22% asthma rate in some of our schools. Um, we saw four times higher um, uh, asthma hospitalization rate in young black children than white children. What, like looking at those uh, criteria pollutants, are is there, any that are more like impactful on human health or like uh, from where those sources are coming from or is it, is it kind of just more of a concoction? Like what are the strategies that, you know, that like connect it to the human health aspect of it? Uh, so the one that's most impactful for human health is PM 2.5 or fine particulate matter. So that, you know, makes up of the sort of attributable health burden to air pollution, it's something, particulate matter is something like 90 or 95% of it, mm. with ozone being number two and then everything else sort of smaller. Um, now, that's sort of population-wide, and again, that's because like everyone's always breathing particles, right? So obviously, if you live right near a source that's emitting oh, something yeah. really toxic into the air, and that's harming your family or yourself, you know, then you're sort of subject to that really nearby source. But when you integrate over, you know, millions of people, it's all of us always breathing some amount of particles. Interesting. And, and so you guys have done some work too. I mean, uh, uh, two questions, I guess. What helped you determine like the deployment of the ramp sensors? That's question one, maybe for Subu. And then, you know, uh, you know, Albert, maybe to follow up with that, um, you've also talked a lot in your work around the Black Carbon Rivers project too. And maybe if we can, you know, go from ramp into Black Carbon Rivers to explain some of those health implications. But Subu, we'll start with you. Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, the, uh, I mean, we, we, had, we had a plan, right? We always started with a good plan. And uh, we were, we were uh, so this is sort of, uh, this will, the, Albert will explain this Black Carbon map, but we're uh, that there, there is an idea, there's a theory that pollution can be explained by land use uh, factors, like uh, how much traffic is there in a particular area? Uh, is there building height? Are there more restaurants, commercial activity, things like that, right? And so we were trying to cover a range of these land use attributes when we were trying to find sites in Pittsburgh. And we were trying to get tra sites with high traffic and high restaurants, which should be like downtown Pittsburgh or sites with high restaurant density, lower traffic, maybe kind of like Highland Park parts of it or uh, things like, you know, completely residential, uh, you know, point breeze, maybe things like that or industrial. So we're trying to cover a range of these site attributes in our plan. Uh, that's number one. And number two, finding willing hosts and volunteers. Mm -hmm. And this is where we end up being opportunistic to some extent. Uh, so I lived in Swiss Whale. So I had a monitor out on my front yard, on my front porch. And uh, Al you saw Albert's monitor on this patio. And there were some other CME faculty and students who had monitors at their houses, alumni. But also we worked closely with uh, uh, GASP and uh, Clean Water Action, and they put us in touch with their networks. And so we were able to find more sites. Uh, some of it was just, okay, we need a monitor in this area. Uh, let's go knock on some doors. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, people are pretty open and you know, they were 
pretty uh, happy to take monitors. Uh, we were approached by groups like ACAN, for example, uh, who are up in you know Shenango and, and Neville yeah. Island areas, and they were interested in putting monitors up there. So some of it word of mouth, some of it certain you know opportunistic. Uh, there was a plan underlying that, and uh, you know we didn't quite follow the plan, but came close enough, I think. Interesting, and 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 Albert, uh, maybe about the the Black Carbon River study. Yeah, uh, and so. For those on the video feed, I'll share the screen. So this is the, this is specifically what sort of Grant is referring to. Um, and this was actually collected. I mean, there's some nuance. We collected this data a different way. This wasn't with the ramps, but you know, it's the same idea. It's to sort of get community level air quality. Uh, black carbon is a component of particulate matter. So if you're ever behind a diesel truck and it burps out a big black cloud, that's what we're talking about. That's black carbon, um, okay. Yep, and, and you get it, it just, it gets made in your engine um, under certain conditions. And actually the conditions it gets made under are super cool. That's a different topic, but, um, but it's a good indicator for sort of, excuse me, it's a good indicator for traffic pollution. Um, it's a good indicator for diesel emissions because it turns out that diesel emissions are sort of worse for you than gasoline car emissions. So it's sort of good to know where the diesels are. Um, and then it's also a good indicator for sort of industrial emissions locally. And so what we did is we collected data in a bunch of places. Uh, and then as Subu was just saying, you can link to some extent air quality to the way the land is used. And mm -hmm. so we built a statistical model that then we could fill out for the whole county. Um, and so, you know, for those who are only listening, you can imagine that, you know, if you're near a big highway with lots of trucks on it, you're going to have more black carbon than when you're away from it, you know, in a park or something, mm -hmm. right? So we can see roadways on this map, you know, and then in a place like downtown where lots of roadways come together, you know, there's always sort of high traffic, you get high concentrations. And that's made a little bit worse by the river valley effect, it's essentially that, you know, all the cars driving into downtown are down in a, in a bowl almost. Mm -hmm. And the same way as when you like dump a bunch of sugar into a glass and it's hard to sort of mix it to the top, mm -hmm. um, the air wants to stay down in the bowl at the bottom. And so you get higher concentrations when you're down in the downtown street canyons because there's a lot of source and it's hard to get the air to mix upward. Interesting. Uh, and then for people who live, you know, near the industrial sources, this is sort of more in the Mon Valley, you know, there are also higher concentrations there for you're, you're, it, there's another bowl, right? It's another river valley. Um, but then there's a different set of sources, right? There are the industrial sources and it's again, hard to get the air out of the valley. So, so maybe just to paint, paint a little picture here, like what, what we're looking at is a map, um, I'm just my own interpretation where we have kind of the red lines are your, your key transportation nodes, your high places of uh, building density or industrial operations. And, and that's where we're seeing like the greatest concentrations of effectively mm -hmm. black carbon, right? Yep. yep. Is, there, is there any relation to like the river travel? Is that, is that a pollution source? All the barges and Question. traffic on the uh, road? So potentially, um, and I don't have a good sense of the volume. You know, when you think about it, there's like a car per person approximately mm -hmm. in the US. So. You know, I'm showing here a map of the whole of Allegheny County, which means there's something on the order of a million cars. Um, you know, and I don't know how many barges are going down. You know, it's not near a million, but uh, potentially. But we're also maybe not super good at capturing that information because we're not measuring like right over the middle of the river, right? We're measuring, you know, on the shore. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in this case, like how many sensors or units did you guys have to deploy to kind of capture the type of information that, that we're seeing here? So this was done with a mobile lab. Okay. Um, and then we went to the data underlying this particular map had 70 unique locations that we visited wow. at multiple times a day in multiple seasons. And they fit all these different categories Subu was talking about, right? Like high traffic, low traffic, high traffic with tall buildings, high traffic with sh short buildings, things like that. 
you know, it, it's interesting too, Subi, you, you mentioned that the role of land use decisions uh, you know, one of the things that the city is uh, initiating uh, is its first ever comprehensive land use plan. Um, so it's called Forge PGH. What what are some things are, you know, I guess two questions here. One is like, what are some things that we could do to help educate people about this connection with regards to pollution and land use? And then, you know, one of the things that, you know, we look to, you know, this data for is effectively decision support tools, right? Um, so how do you start to make better investment or policy decisions, um, you know, to, to, you know, basically reduce pollution and the impacts on the environment and on public health and specifically, um, what are some thoughts that you have, or you've seen with kind of the ramp data or others that land use decisions in particular, that we can make, uh, improve decisions? Uh, that's actually a very good question. And, uh, I think, uh, uh, I think we have lots of stories probably from the RAP uh, network and our own personal and research, other research. Uh, I think Albert can talk a lot about the mobile monitoring that they have done, for example. Uh, but, you know, one of the examples that kind of, uh, it might be important uh, is something along the lines of, if, you, if there is no way for the air to escape, it, the pollution is just going to build up. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, these, the, uh, I mean, so uh, uh, Al, uh, so our colleague Neil Donahue has, and I attribute the statement to him, is basically if there was no sources of pollution, then your air quality, you know, air pollution would be zero. Right. So I mean, that that is that is a way for meteorology to be important, but that is also the role of sources to be important, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so one example that comes to mind is uh, uh, we we have put sensors in a lot of places, especially in downtown Pittsburgh. And where there are a lot of street canyons, basically these are, you know, uh, street canyons are, you know, where there are tall buildings on either side. So there is a kind of a canyon effect that builds up and there's not enough air movement to clean out pollution. And if you have a source there, like a restaurant exhaust, for example, that doesn't have a good exhaust uh, uh, filtration system, then the pollution just can build up in there. And that's exactly what you found as one of our ramps was deployed in, in this particular location. Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to name names, Albert, but uh, I'm not going to, uh, but- uh, I think I know the instance myself. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> if, if you've walked around downtown Pittsburgh, you know, you probably get to know it pretty quickly. And, uh, you know, I think uh, my uh, thought as well, I mean, you know, there aren't a whole lot of people who go into this back alley, maybe it's fine, but, the, it, it enters into the next neighboring buildings mm -hmm. and then the workers often go out to take their breaks into that back alley, delivery workers coming to deliver stuff. So, you know, there are people who go in and out and they breathe the stuff, right? Yeah. And uh, so land, so street cannons, plus the other areas like, for example, Mellon Square Park, you know, where there's a lot of bus traffic and diesel buses are, de are put out a lot of soot, uh, black carbon or elemental carbon. Yep. And uh, because, of the, because of the tall buildings on either side, there is no way for that pollution to escape. And so that pollution just builds up at those locations. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I think uh, in terms of, I mean, this has implications for traffic policy, for planning. Now you might say, well, the buildings are already there. What are you going to do, right? Yep. And so the other thing might be, well, you can replace the diesel buses with, electric buses, for example, yeah. uh, or if you're building out new uh, planning or new areas, then maybe don't put so many uh, buildings close to each other where you have street canyon effects, for example, mm -hmm. uh, put out more parks so there's more open air, open space, things like that. Interesting. Uh, there are also issues of, you know, things, uh, I'm going to put this on the city maybe, but, uh, uh, you know, but the more stringent enforcement of restaurant mm. exhaust. Uh -huh. uh, mm. I think, I think uh, there has been a lot of uh, successful focus on vehicular exhaust reductions, right? And so cars today are much cleaner than they were 30 years ago mm -hmm. or even 10 years ago. Uh, but restaurants apparently are still unregulated or you know, not as well regulated. And you know, we all live near restaurants, right? So. Yeah, I mean, and it seems too that, um, 
you know, working in government it, about what I'm about to say isn't always true, but it seems like these are simple solutions, right? That, you know, uh, switching from a diesel bus to an electric bus, um, particularly as technology has advanced rapidly, like those choices are available or enforcement or uh, improving uh, kind of the ventilation systems with exhausts or even like uh, increasing parks and walking and biking opportunities through downtown can be a big of assistance. Um, you know, uh, one of the things, uh, Rebecca, that you've worked on with, with Melanie and our team, Melanie Ariola, who's a guest a couple of weeks ago, has been the issues of uh, inversions and, and how we've seen that uh, play out in an increasing effect with regards to uh, the the frequency, right? The frequency of inversions. Um, you know, I'd be interested to hear from you on on that, like maybe to explain and, and how that impacts kind of the black, black carbon river effect and some of the things that we've seen uh, from a climate perspective. Yeah, I was wondering the same thing when we, when Albert flashed that map. Um, so we, through some of our climate adaptation planning have been looking at like the number of inversions that have been occurring over the past few years. Um, so I guess looking a little bit historically and then looking in more recent years, we've been trying to gauge how the weather, how the temp, how the climate is changing in Pittsburgh. So what we think is happening is that uh, as, as we're experiencing more extreme temperature swings, um, we're seeing more inversion events because those, the, the inversion events tend to happen when a warm, when a warm front comes in, right, and traps the cold air down below. Um, so when we do have those, you know, extreme, just like yesterday was what, 85 degrees. Mm -hmm. um, so when you do just have that wave of, of warm air that starts coming in, um, you know, we, we're seeing more of those swings, right? And the pollution gets trapped. Um, so yeah, I, I was interested, you know, you said that you did some time of day studies. Um, it seems like those inversions occur more in, in the morning um, you know, when the day breaks, I'd, I'd be interested to, you know, hear if, if, if your, your data and your, your, uh, monitoring matches up with, um, with those inversion events and, and kind of how that plays out in terms of black carbon. Right. Uh, so I, yeah, so the inversions do happen in the morning, right? They're, you know, they basically happen when you have a sunny previous day and then at night it's clear and the ground gets sort of colder than the air above it. And then that sort of creates a cycle where the air can't sort of rise too high. And so it traps everything near the ground. Um, so it ends up, so one thing, it ends up being this weird counterintuitive thing because people complain about the weather in Pittsburgh, but you get inversions after really nice days. Um, the, uh, so I, and I don't know about the long-term trend. I think if you were to ask like the meteorologist at the health department, they would say, you know, it's sort of, there's a lot of variability from year to year, but there's maybe not necessarily a trend. But, you know, when there's a strong inversion, you do get higher ground level air pollution. That happens in Pittsburgh, that happens anywhere. Um, one of the cool things we can see with the ramps is, you know, are there sort of more localized effects, right? So the inversion is going to be a little bit worse when you're in the river valley than when you're up on top of the hill. Um, and so the ramp data can let us see that. Um, you know, you can really see like, oh, is this neighborhood getting hammered worse by the inversion than, than not. And so then if you have like a big source emitting into that aver inversion, mm. the other thing that happens when there's an inversion is that it's not very windy usually. And mm. so if you have a big source emitting into the inversion, that's that pollution just sort of hangs out. It, you know, nothing's pushing it around, nothing is pulling it up. And so, you know, we can use the ramps to see like, oh, like, well, this neighborhood was getting sort of beat up worse than, than that one on the inversion day. It, it feels like um, they're almost predictable kind. I know that there's like some discrepancy if you can prevent, if you can predict like a bad one. Um, but we've been uh, working with a, actually a class at a Heinz college um, to help us think through like, are there some strategies that maybe this, now that we've, you know, gone through the pandemic and we've adaptive, we've adapted, you know, some of our operations, like uh, our staff aren't, aren't coming into, uh, to, to commute into the building, um, you know, are there, now that we're like, okay, at adapting, are there, are there, you know, some other strategies maybe that we want to take um, mm -hmm. when we do see an inversion on the horizon, 
um, to maybe say, you know, a two hour late start or, um, you know, work from home day or maybe our refuse trucks go out a little bit later. Um, you know, strat strategies like that, maybe from like the city operations side that you could think of that might make an impact. So I think that sort of stuff is possible. I mean, I think a lot of people are familiar with the idea of ozone action days where they sort of, you know, put it out like on in the newspaper and in the weather report, you know, like try not to mow your lawn in the middle of the day, don't refill your, mm. you know, try and get gas like at night. Um, you know, so off the top of my head, it's hard for me to say, because I know nothing about city operations, for me to say like, oh, you should do this thing. Um, but it seems like it's doable, right? It, I don't know. It's always tough, I think, and Grant, you were saying like, oh, it should be easy to do this thing. I think from an engineer's perspective, and this is what I say in class, for the engineer, it is easy to say just like, oh yeah, turn this knob. Um, <laughs> getting people to buy into turning the knob is a totally different thing. Yeah. Um, who are knobs? They're knobby, but like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, as I mean, I'm you know, I mean, I'll, I'll go back to what I said earlier, right? I mean, there may be inversions or there may be street canyon effects, but if there were no emission sources, the pollution would not exist, right? right? If there were no cars emitting, you know, exhaust, diesel trucks putting out black carbon, industrial facilities, you know, putting out, uh, you know, uh, plumes, whatever, right? Uh, and if the, they were not there, so uh, the whole idea is that with an inversion, the air is not moving anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And this means, I mean, the, in normal cases, and I always say this, right, and this is actually true, I think about most of Pittsburgh PM2.5 pollution on average comes from elsewhere, right? It's like 80% of PM2.5. Is that still the case, Albert? 80% or 50%? What is it now? 80%? Um, we were just doing this. It's, it's something yeah. like 85%. Right. Right. But you can control the other part, right? You can't do anything with that. You yeah. can control what's local, right? Yeah. And you can control what's local. But so for example, if you, in our, the ramps that are outside and like Bridgeville, the Bridgeville or Bridgeport to forget the, the Bridgeville, Bridgeville probably Bridgeville, right? Yeah. The ones that are further out from the city, right? The, they, they, their average PN 2.5 is like say seven or eight microgram per meter cube. And in the city, it's mm -hmm. like 10 or 11 on average. So really the seven or eight, you really can't do much about the three is what you can control in the city. Hmm. Uh, now, but if you are in an inversion, which is when the pollution levels really go up, air is not going any, it's not coming from anywhere. It's just sitting there in Pittsburgh, right? So the mm -hmm. outside, outside sources are not important. What's important is what is being emitted locally. And so yeah. this includes people who are driving, whether it's diesel trucks, whether it is cars, whether it is uh, industrial facilities, whether it is restaurants, uh, you know, lot, whatever is the local source, basically normal cases, it's not a huge deal, but in terms of an inversion, it just sits there and pools and builds up concentrations, right? That's the whole problem. And yeah. so I think the way to actually avoid those peaks and in that case, because it's not like you can turn a huge blower on somewhere and blow the air out, uh, basically is, I mean, I guess, I said that out loud and I remember the smog towers in India, uh, the, do not take the Lord's name in vain, uh, but uh, the, the, but, you know, but basically somebody's not going to get the idea. Let's put huge blowers outside of Pittsburgh and start blowing the air out during inversions. But the easier thing would be to turn down the emissions as much as possible. And that is really the only reasonable practical solution. Uh, otherwise people just stay home. And even if people stay home, uh, you know, a lot of buildings in Pittsburgh are old, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, my house in Swiss Wheel was like 105 years old when I bought it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, it, it has lots of leaks from all over the place. Even if you put a fancy air filtration system in place, it has probably leaks all over the place that are coming in. And of course, now in, now in the pandemic times, we start thinking about, well, we need to have better filtration system indoors, for example, to reduce the likelihood of transmission that also helps with indoor air quality. Uh, so that is something that is to be looked at. For example, if city buildings have upgraded HVAC systems, for example, yeah. right? So it makes it safer for people to work in. Uh, Long-term healthcare facilities have better health uh, filtration systems. So vulnerable populations are better protected against outdoor air pollution. So, but those are you know infrastructure problem, infrastructure solutions, right? And uh, 
infrastructure seems to be the new buzzword, right? I mean, the $3 trillion or whatever, but sorts of things that people had to focus on, I think. And uh, anyways, I can go on and on, but. <laughs> I, I would say that I, I, my line with the infrastructure is that buildings are infrastructure um, and they have such a huge impact in terms of both emissions or like you're saying, filtration. Um, you know, pick up on a couple a couple of thoughts here. One is, uh, Rebecca, you you've talked about this through like a, a demand response type of program for air quality. Like, is there ways to develop like a real time um, and for folks that are listening, like demand response is a tool that we use in like the energy space to curtail energy usage. Like, would there be ways in which we could create a similar type of uh, demand response program for air quality issues? I don't know if Rebecca, if you had any thoughts on that. Oh, me. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> so I guess that's kind of what we're, we've asked like the Heinz class to look at. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, you know, thinking about things from like, are we, are our refuse trucks coming out at the, at the right time in the morning? Um, you know, is there, is there a way if we see an inversion coming on the horizon that, you know, we could delay like start time of work or, um, maybe delay uh, those heavier construction projects when you're, you know, ripping up the, the street in front of someone's house. I know there's a lot of complications with that and, you know, union issues and, and work hours. Um, but, uh, you know, they're, they're uh, thinking about th strategies from, you know, like operations and heavy operations like that. So, you know, workforce and start time uh, to, I know Tree Pittsburgh has done a lot of work around um, planting more evergreen trees um, mm -hmm. so that, you know, there, there is a little bit of like a pollutant sink, I guess, um, in the wintertime when all those deciduous trees lose their, lose their leaves and their ability to um, soak up some of, the, some of those pollutants. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I guess the, the strategies are out there, but, um, you know, what, what is it that we could come up with like a suite of options that we could do um, yeah. now that, you know, we've, we've uh, adapted, I'd say pretty well um, to the pandemic all of a sudden, it seems like now's the time to start to try to implement some of those other um, adopt adaptions, adaptations. Actually, if I, can, uh, if I can follow up on that real quick, I thought that just occurred to me. And uh, you know, a problem that Rebecca mentioned is that if we ask uh, work crews to start work later and then you run into union issues, right? And so, you know, I mean, I think, uh, one thing that I've often seen over the last year is basically, why aren't we just paying people to sit at home, right? And uh, the that you know, that has huge implications for pandemic transmission, but it's the same thing with air pollution. Uh, you know, I mean, so the thing is, if you're delaying work, that means the union members or, you know, they say, we don't want to work longer than, you know, 5 p.m. or whatever, right? Uh, fine, let them just work for five hours and the city pays them for eight hours. Uh, I mean, so there is an added cost of three hours of extra pay that they're being paid. Uh, the difference is health effects, right? And, uh, you know, air pollution is huge detrimental impacts on human health. And that affects everybody, not just the workers, including the workers, but everybody, right? And so maybe the Heinz College or people there can actually do a little study on saying, if you, you know, have people work for shorter hours during the day, but we pay them the same amount anyway, would that have a net beneficial impact through the savings on human health? Yeah. Yeah. And I would, I would, my hypothesis would, my guess would be yes. You know, maybe, maybe just to pick up with that in the, just to kind of wrap up, we're coming up against time here and this has been super fascinating. Um, what for, for each of you, I guess, what has been your lesson from the pandemic as it pertains to air quality. Um, and I, the, the genesis of that question is like, I, I recall here in Pittsburgh, you know, in the really probably around this time last year in the, you know, spring of 20, um, you know, when we were in that, you know, kind of lockdown phase in space uh, and transportation emissions drastically decreased. And, uh, you know, I remember having the ability to smell and to hear in the city, which were like kind of two of my reflections. And, um, you know, any, how did that, how did that kind of impact you guys and as well as kind of your research and some of your thinking 
um, in terms of what it's like when pollution's reduced and like, how do we bake those in? Um, maybe Albert, I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah, so one of the cool things about having a the ramp network is that we could, it kept running even though we weren't allowed on campus or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so definitely people drove less. We can see that in our data. Um, you know, whether overall air pollution got better is, is a much harder question to answer because it depends on a lot of other things, but definitely you could tell that from the data that people were not driving as much. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there were benefits to that. And something we're trying to take a look at now, I'll probably have students start working on this soon, is, uh, you know, how fast did people come back? And as they came back, we were able to get some ramps in places. I know the city closed a couple streets, you know, tried some traffic free zones or these restaurant zones. And so we have a couple of ramps, like in Market Square, we have one. We have one. Uh, I'm sorry, I am blanking. We have another one on a street that was that got closed. Uh, so to look if, if there's like some sort of hyper local benefit that could be maintained, you know, and obviously it'll be a little bit tough because things sort of open and closed and open and closed and now they're opening again and hopefully right. they don't have to close again. Uh, but that's something we'll be able to look at. Interesting. Subu, how about you? So I think the the study that I think Albert that Albert referred to uh, we published this, they published this paper in the ESNT letters last year uh, was basically that with the lockdown uh, and with people driving less uh, I think the net effect on P the the rush hour PM two point five levels went down by about one microgram per meter cube which is about like ten uh, about ten percent of the PM two point five at that at that time. Uh, but overall, I think on average, it went down by like 0.3 microgram per meter cube, which is 3% of PM2.5. So, you know, all, the, all that driving less basically uh, reduced PM2.5 in Pittsburgh by like 3%. I mean, wow. you know, so it's not a huge fraction. And some of that, I think, is because, uh, again, like I said, on average, most of the pollution comes from outside. Like 80% of it is regionally transported through secondary processes. Uh, and uh, there are, I mean, you can go to all sorts of atmospheric chemistry reasons why. But uh, also because cars are much cleaner now than they used to be. And the EPA has a lot of successes under its belt, which we don't often talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the... The other thing that I'll come back to sort of returning to how I started in air quality, right, is uh, I grew up in India. And uh, so, you know, I mean, growing up, I often had like bronchitis and respiratory issues and things like that, right? And uh, when I moved to Pittsburgh for grad school, a uh, lot of people might be shocked to hear this in Pittsburgh is that my health actually improved. Mm. And it's, I mean, all risk is relative. Right? I mean, there's like, I think 90% of the world would love to have Pittsburgh's air quality. Mm -hmm. uh, that's because the EPA and the ACHD and everybody else has been working on reducing air pollution over the last 30 years, 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you actually look at some of the other cities around the world, like Delhi or other places, the lockdowns have had much more significant impacts on air pollution because a lot more of the cars are more polluting, a lot more of the pollution is local or other sources, things like that. And so those have definitely reduced, uh, you know, pollution much more significantly than the lockdowns have reduced pollution in Pittsburgh. Interesting. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, I just kind of think of it because right now, you know, I mean, I left Pittsburgh two years ago, moved to France, uh, and now I live in the Middle East and, you know, I would rather be living, breathing Pittsburgh air right now. <laughs> Wow, that's a that's an endorsement, um, Rebecca. How about you? Some some reflections. No, oh, well, I live underneath the Parkway, so I've the three seventy six. But I def, I mean, you can definitely tell the difference just in noise and um, definitely in air quality uh, during the lockdown. Um, but you know, I guess. Uh, yeah, spending more time at home and, and being outside more often and not in a building, you're kind of you're more acutely aware of um, the ebbs and flows of, of the air pollution and, and the traffic. So, I mean, yeah, I definitely noticed a huge difference. Um, it seems like it's ramped back up now and it's it's less um, 
like the the traffic flow i think is more of an all day event now instead of like mm -hmm. that that uh, quick traffic flow in the morning for the commute and then in the afternoon commute um so yeah i guess i'd be interested to you know stay tuned and and see what the data shows for for car travel and and how that's uh, changed as a result of the pandemic interesting Albert, uh, I'm going to give you the final word. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, Shared Air and the podcast that you've developed? Yeah, so um, so Shared Air is a podcast that is co-hosted by myself and Rose Eilenberg, who's a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and so we talk about air quality and climate and sort of science communication. Um, and so we've had a number of different really great guests talking about environmental justice and, you know, COVID a few times. Um, our most recent episode is about, is we interviewed Chris Frey, who's a, a, a professor at NC State, but now is in an, in an administrative position at EPA. And so we talked about EPA and the Biden administration versus the Trump administration. Um, so yeah, I encourage people to check it out. It is on, you know, you can find it on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher and Spotify and all of the sort of main, um, you know, platforms. Awesome. That's terrific. Well, thank you guys for sharing uh, all your experience with us. And we love partnering with you and the uh, research and, and work that you guys are doing at, at Carnegie Mellon on air quality. Um, Subu, Albert, uh, you guys are friends of the Grant Street experience. And uh, Rebecca and I appreciate you joining us today and sharing a little bit of wisdom with us. Thanks so much for <laughs> Thanks for the us. chance. Excellent. Well, thank you all for listening in to the Grant Street Experience. Rebecca, Albert, Subu, uh, great to be with you guys today. Uh, listen in and check us out next time on the Grant Street Experience. Have a great day wherever you are. Take care. Mm -hmm.